Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to start the next session titled the 360 Experience Kids 1. So uh, please help me by putting your hands together to welcome our moderator and panelists for this session. Firstly, we have Mr. Don Anderson, Head of Family and Learning Partnerships from UTO. Next, we have uh, He Min Gema Ju, Head of Content, Smart Study. Next, we have Sana Amanat, Director of Content and Character Development, Marvel Entertainment. Next, we have Olivia Dumont, Managing Director, Family and Licensing Entertainment One. And last but not least, Mr. Rajiv Chilaka, Founder and CEO, Green Gold Animation Private Limited. I'll hand over the stage right now to uh, Mr. Don Anderson. Thank you very much. I, am, I have to say this is like one of the best panels that I think I've ever had the opportunity to moderate. I am so happy to be on the same stage with these four individuals. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. I'd like to start off with um, storytelling. And Olivia and I, we were having uh, breakfast with, with my colleague Mackie, and we were talking about the chicken and egg solution. You know, what, where does it all start? Where is the genesis of, uh, of a story? Do you start with character? Do you start with environment? What's your perspective on where to begin? I mean, on our side, it's specific to Entertainment One. We take on very, very few brands. Um, and so as a result, we're always looking for a white space in the marketplace. Um, uh, which is complementary to our own brands, and this is where we start from, and then we start, we try to find, so as a result, an environment, if you want, or a theme, and then we try to develop or find characters or stories that will fit into that theme. So that's how we start. Rajiv, what, how would you answer that question? Yeah, I think for me it's also the same, the characters come first. Like when I created Chota Beam, the idea came to me in 15 minutes, the first thing I developed was the characters, written the character sketches, uh, and built a universe around, around the characters, and then came storytelling. So that model really worked for me, and most recently, whatever IPs that we have been creating, it's always the character first for, for us, and then we built on the uh, other aspects. So when you have great characters, I think it's easier to, for me personally, I, I feel it's easier to tell stories. Which is interesting because if you, I don't know how many here are parents. Could, for those who are parents in here who've probably had no sleep last night or, uh, you know, for most of their lives, could you raise your hands? Well, a few, about half, half the audience here. But if you, I don't know how many of you actually sit up at night and tell your sons or daughters stories. Sitting in, you know, and telling them through that process. Most of my, my kids are seven and four. They always ask, Daddy, can you tell a story from scratch? And we always just like, oh God, I've just had the most brutal day and you're now asking me to think more. Okay, we'll give it a shot. So you usually start with that kind of like where, well, once upon a time, <laughs> and it goes from there. Santa, how do you tell stories or do you? I actually get the same question. I have 12 nephews and nieces, so oh. I get that question very often. And I just keep retelling actually a comic book story that they've never heard of. I pretend it's my idea. <laughs> I think I'm, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of terrible. But, um, you know, for, for us, you know, at least at Marvel, we always think about who our characters are fundamentally as human beings first. Um, I think we, we think about those relatable qualities of um, a, a particular character and then we layer on all the other elements, like whether they're going to be wearing a mask or a cape or, you know, superhero tights. Um, and, uh, you know, when we're building a story, we try to find the things that, uh, you know, that we will connect with and, and what we feel our audiences are, are going to connect with. So we start very small. That's how we, be that's the beginning of, of storytelling is starting very, very small in the details and then start adding, um, we start a adding the, the environment and start building the world uh, around that um, because then it feels more, more realistic and, and exciting. And then, of course, you just have to have uh, a lot of uh, beating up bad guys yeah. that, you know, my nephews and nieces seem to like. <laughs> always always got to have yeah. a bad guy in there, right? Oh, always got to yeah, yeah. do it. Yeah. <laughs> I find that as well. Gemma, I mean, when, with your, uh, you've had tremendous success. Smart Study uh, out of Korea had a has had tremendous success uh, with Pink Fong. Could you share a little bit more about the genesis of Pink Fong, how it's evolved over time? Because it, you're really actually a mobile app company to begin with, right? Yeah. 
Yes, actually, Ping Fong Smart Study has started with the highly experienced content creation team and also computer programmers. So actually, we just started with mobile apps, released like 100 mobile apps for kids, and then we accumulated users, and then we just released our shorts, music videos for kids. And thanks to YouTube, we now have like more than 4.5 million subscribers and 3 billion views acquired. Mm. And, and now, how do you take that from, uh, uh, you know, again, you put a lot of music onto YouTube, you put a lot of the characters. Now, what are you going to do with the character next in terms of the storytelling sense? So actually, most of our content has catch tune. So that's why Ping Fong Baby Shark became worldwide sensation with a lot of covers videos. Uh, so our concept is entertaining and also educational videos. And now we are looking like we are in production of longer formats with Ping Fong because like Ping Fong has been so popular with his brand and his characteristic with short videos. So like at the end of the 2018, we will have Ping for Wonder Star 3D animation. Yeah, which is really interesting because you again you started out with short form, uh, more music based. How is this? This enters the question or, or establishes the question of the transition, the, tra uh, the traditional versus digital, short form versus long form, and the perspectives around that. We're in kind of this era of disruption and such. Do you have to do it all to survive now? Rajiv. I think, uh, see today it's, uh, there is content which is short form, long term, uh, long form. So we, for, for me, it is always to give your viewer everything that you got, so everything can, uh, you can give them. For example, our shows, we, we have shorts, one minute, we have in five minutes, we have in 11 minutes, we have 20 minutes, we have 66 minutes, we have 100 minutes. So we try to tell everything because different people want to see different things at different times and we, we want to cater to all those needs. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, you have less time, sometimes you have more time. If you go to, a, if a kid is in, uh, in, in a theater, he would love to watch 100 minutes, but if you, make him sit in front of an iPad, I don't think he'll watch 100 minutes. He would like to see uh, five minutes or 11 minutes kind of content, maximum 20 minutes. So we, we, we are doing everything, honestly, and everything has been working for us. Yeah. And Marvel as well. We were talking in the Speaker's Lounge uh, about the idea of short form content. Can you explain a little bit more about what you're doing there and how you're targeting that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the great thing about Marvel is that we have so many different types of content out there, just in terms of medium and formats and platforms and all of that. It's a full sort of Marvel universe in every sense of the word. Um, and so what we're doing uh, with uh, short form content um, in particular, and that's sort of a place that we're playing in with particularly for kids and the kids demographic is um, uh, doing sort of two to three minutes in, uh, and, and actually taking some stylistic risks with them as well. Um, we also understand that there's some content, we can build a 22 minute special and then break it out into different pieces that we can start putting into different areas. So you can break a 22 minute special into uh, 11 minutes and then down from there you can b break it into sort of three and a half minutes um, packages at a time so uh, taking those and putting them in d different areas and being aware of um, you know telling bite-sized pieces of story at the same time it's it's a little tricky mm. um, but I do think that's how uh, people are consuming content and also how parents want their kids to consume content on a limited basis say okay here you get five minutes ten minutes of iPad time um, so we want to make sure that we we can get the most out of it and tell an entertaining story, but also really sell what Marvel is all about to hopefully our new fans. And how does that work with E1? I mean, you're going through some interesting um, efforts in APAC, particularly with Japan. We talked about this this morning. Peppa yeah. Pig and, um, and certainly with, uh, with uh, PJ Masks yeah. has been a huge success. Yeah. Where, where does it go next? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we are we are still introducing ourselves um, to the region, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of great potential here. The Marvel brand is very strong. Yeah. People are very excited about our content. We don't fundamentally want to change it. We just want to expand the universe, and we've been trying it out by creating more localized characters mm -hmm. um, on more localized platforms, um, but also making sure that those characters that we create in particular are a part of the Marvel universe. We're not yeah. trying to go and create a niche space just for one region. Right. region. 
Legion, we're saying these characters are just as awesome as all of the other Marvel heroes, and we bring them into the Marvel Universe. They're in comics, they're in games. Um, so we're trying that out, and people seem to be responding pretty well to it, but um, it, it's, there's, there's so much great content out here yeah. and already, so we want to make sure we complement it as much as possible. Well, let, talking of great content, yeah. Peppa Pig... PJ Masks, and again, how then you look at localization of that content. Olivier? So on, on, on our side, we, 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 and it's speaking to your point, we really want to make sure that our content is available at any given time on mm -hmm. all the platforms. So it's really making sure that you have content adapted to each of the different platforms, mm -hmm. so it, that it's available all the time. Yeah. Um, so we make long form content, short form content, music videos, all of this content, but mm -hmm. It's to, to ensure that at whatever is your first point of entry into the brand, and it can be YouTube, it can be because you saw it on TV, it can be because you saw it on Netflix, or because you saw it on another as well platform. At the end of the day, when, it, when you're, you're going to see the same content on another platform, you're going to stay. Yeah. So what we have found in terms of research is that those platforms, oddly enough, do not cannibalize each other. Mm -hmm. They sort of they ignite the brand. So they right. allow the, you know, sort of the, the viewer to, to have access to their favorite brand sort of all the time. And you have a different experience when you're watching it on a bigger screen and, you know, whether it's linear TV or, or SVOD or on a smaller screen very often times for YouTube on a tablet or, or, or on a phone. Yeah. So we, we, we you know, the traditional model is getting it on broadcast TV first, but, you know, there are countries where it's not necessarily possible or your broadcast exposure is pretty small, then this is when we really need to beef up our efforts on digital platforms, whether uh, SVOD or AVOD, to ensure that the, the, the kids and their parents have access to the content. What have you, now, the Japan entry effort that you've done in terms of internationalization, what has that been like? What are some of the learnings that you can share with the audience here from that? Uh, I know it's been, in, in, it's been wow. in a long time coming, right? Don't slash your wrist just yet, you know, sort of, you know, after your second visit, uh, <laughs> it gets better sometimes. Uh, with, with Japan, it's very, you know, long and, and uh, to, uh, to place your content. There's very, there's very, the very little space. So the great news about Japan, though, is that because of the digital platforms, um, are picking up a little bit in pace there, you know, digital consumption in Japan was sort of the lowest almost in the world, if that makes sense. It's, it, it, was, it didn't make sense to me definitely when I started going to, to Japan is realizing how, you know, sort of behind they are in terms of digital consumption. So it's finally picking up now with Esvod platforms, Avod platforms, which are growing more and more. And that will give, I think, a boost to the market because you know, you won't, the, the consumers won't have to go through gatekeepers anymore. They'll be able to find the content on their own, you know, through, through those digital platforms. Yeah. So I think this is going to shake things up quite um, um, significantly, hopefully, in, uh, in Japan and allow a lot more brands to connect with the, uh, with the audience because particularly in our, in our space, uh, which is preschool, I mean, it's insane how limited the choices are for preschoolers. It's uh, yeah. probably the most limited in the entire world. You know, like preschoolers have access to very, very few brands in in uh, yeah. in uh, in Japan. But what would it, what have you done differently there than you would have done anywhere else? Well, I, you know, sort of. So we we did manage to you know to find some form of of broadcast exposure there. Mm -hmm. But we realized that we need to complement that very little exposure that we have on linear TV through, you know, through digital, yeah. through digital platforms. So working with you guys, and we're going to be working even more. So probably more so in Japan that we do in other markets where we're relying a lot more on traditional media or yeah. linear TV to to uh, boost the exposure. Yeah. Roger, for yourselves too, talking about platforms, you've recently done a really interesting uh, deal with Netflix. Could you share a little bit more about that? Uh, yes. Uh, so I talked about Chota Beam. So we are now doing a, a new version of uh, Chota Beam called as Mighty Little Beam. Mm. So this is going to be an international version of it. And it is going to be a Netflix original, so we're very proud of that. Uh, it's going to be uh, f uh, 52 episodes of five minutes, and we are. It's currently in production. Right. So uh, it's a it's an interesting take on the character of Beam. So originally the series is a 2D animated series. We have a nine-year-old kid, but now we have a, uh, we're going to tell the story of Beam as a baby 
and uh, it's already a brand that 72% of Indian kids uh, uh, follow Chota Beam. Mm. So, uh, and, and not that's just in India and then across Asia, Southeast Asia also, it's pretty popular in the Middle East is very popular. Mm. So it's been traveling and uh, it was launched in 2008. Uh, so now we're bringing it in a different form. So it's going to be uh, a sound off show. So uh, Beam is a baby, so it's a toddler. So it's going to be between 12 months and 15 months. So there, there are going to be no dialogues in the show. Uh, but the setting is Indian, it's an Indian village. Uh, so we are very excited and uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we, sh uh, we made a test uh, clip and everybody loved it. We, I mean, we did a test with the babies and everyone, it was great. So it's targeted at preschool, right. uh, two to six year olds. And uh, it's always been a dream for us to work, uh, to be on Netflix uh, and coming uh, from India, it was not going, to, it was always going to be a challenge to be on Netflix, uh, uh, so uh, it's been a dream uh, come true. But how did you arrive at that? Why in Netflix, and what do you see that Netflix provides over others? I think today it's the worldwide is the number one platform. Uh, I mean, if you want, I think they have a reach to 190 countries. I mean, on your your content will be exposed to 190 countries on day one. <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's something. Uh, it's a it's a premium content and. It is something that every creator, creators dream to do something like this. And uh, so, uh, uh, so we're very happy and uh, we, uh, the development wise also, uh, we've been a studio that has been working for uh, Indian market specifically. Yeah. So suddenly we have, we've been working on uh, uh, different kind of budgets and different kind of uh, timelines. We have, we had to deliver, uh, we've been given deadlines 15 days before, and we're making episodes in 15 days, delivering from script to storyboard things. So we've been working around crazy things. Now we actually have time to really focus, plan, and then they're hand-holding us to create a global show. Yeah. So we're learning a lot in this process. And I think, uh, so I think as an Asian studio, we're very proud, and we, we hope that more Asian studios will also do similar shows yeah. for Netflix. Gemma, when you look at internationalization for your for smart study, what markets are you focusing in specifically, and what kind of strategies are you actually applying? So actually, these days, ping pong baby shark is so popular, in, it's a sensation in Indonesia and neighboring countries. So we are concentrating on SEA markets, and for our strategy is actually mobile first. So our videos are mobile first videos, which like. We even applied iPhone X screen size like last week, and we prepared the all size of you know mobile screens. And we have a technician team so that we just can upload our content, video content on our web server, and then you can get the transcoded files just one in an hour. Mm. And then like we upload our videos on YouTube and multiple channels, social media platforms just after the day because we have an in-house distribution team. Mm. So actually the speed is crucial for us because our new generation is always like craving for new videos. Mm. So we put many variations of Baby Shark by ourselves. So we remade like 12 versions of Baby Shark, Christmas version, traditional Korean music version, like electronic music version, so that kids kept keep captivated by our channels. Right. How do you find uh, sustainability? Is there one platform or an, over another that you find that is more sustainable than, other, than the other? Yes, actually, like, I believe that multiple channels just let us live long and also captivate more fans because like, just one channel, we cannot make a, enough exposure for our kids' brand. And also the multiple channel, you can get worldwide users. Yeah, that's how we work. And the importance of analytics, I think this is a question for all of you, how closely are you watching or looking at and analyzing what you're getting out in terms of the data from these platforms? It's, it's a crucial part of our business, yeah. sort of making sure that we, we are aware exactly of who's consuming our content, where, how, you know, when, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's crucial. So we have an in-house department, sort of um, uh, analytic, analytics department. How big is that, how big is that team? No, it's just, well, it's two persons, yeah. so, yeah, and across, <laughs> so the analyze. They're covering all global yeah. markets, right? But, you know, sort of collecting sort of the, the data, but on across all platforms, so it's app sales, it's, you know, sort of YouTube yeah. is, is part of that, um, you know, sort of ratings, all of it, so that we get a, you know, clear picture. Our commercial teams 
get a clear picture, which they can then relay in a sort of digestible manner to licensees in particular and retailers and right. you know partners in general. Sure. I'm, a, I'm like, I'm a creative person, so I should never be asked about statistics or math because there's like a 100%, 99.9% chance I'm going to be wrong. Um, so I will, I, I base it on the fact that, you know, Mar at Marvel, we have just so many different kinds of platforms, so much, so many different kinds of content, content experiences. Yeah. Um, and we are very much looking at, yes, how our viewers are taking in our content, who they are, um, what they're actually interested in. Uh, but because we've had our audience has expanded so much because of the fact that our content has expanded so rapidly yeah. um, uh, and is uh, it, it's so different than what it was even 10 years ago, mm. um, we are aware it's that we're still kind of learning about our audience. Right. Um, and we just have to make sure that we are creating content um, in ways and uh, it's for, from a stylistic and a creative point of view, but also from uh, a format point of view in ways that they would like, in ways that they engage with. So we're from, and I'm speaking from a digital point of view, but I'm also talking about um, our comics and our publishing lines. Um, just across the way, there's different fans like to experience the Marvel Universe yeah. um, in, in a variety of ways. And it goes from the films to animation to games. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that we are there as much as possible, and also that we are putting the right kind of content out there for the types of demos that are coming in. But do you, with analytics, do they overshadow the creative process at all, or is it just an ingredient? No, I think it's just an ingredient. I don't think analytics should, because at the end of the day, when you're in a creative field, a lot of it is based on instinct. A mm. lot of it is based on ideas that you have that you want to put out into the world, and it's just a few individuals saying, why don't we tell a, a, a story about a, a particular individual's experience, about a minority experience? Um, that's really where it always begins. Like it always, like we said earlier, begins with character. Yep. Um, and what happens is that you start seeing what works and how people react. And ultimately, I think people are going to react to great stories you know, and, yeah. and we try to do that in a variety of ways as possible. But then at the end of the day, we're also looking at what audiences are we engaging? What audiences are we not engaging? And how do, right. how do we get there? That's where analytics helps. That's the ingredient aspect of it. Right. Rajiv, you started your business in 15 minutes. Within 15 minutes of creating your character, you had one of the biggest businesses for the most part. It, it obviously evolved in India. Chota Beam was pretty much the first in terms of animation character, right? Animated character. Can you tell a little bit about the evolution of that? Yeah. Um, so even though the idea came in 15 minutes, it took forever to sell the idea. <laughs> so uh, the idea was... Uh, so not an overnight success. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, so the, we, uh, I started the company in 2001, and uh, uh, we were making... Uh, uh, we we're trying to make... Uh, character uh, story on Krishna, uh, which we eventually did. So while we were doing the Krishna character, which is one of the historical characters in India, so we found out that there were 17 other companies doing the story of Krishna at the same time we were doing. So that made <laughs> us very insecure because we were a small studio with no funding and the other, some of the studios that were working on Krishna were really big with, com with millions of dollars of funding. So that kind of scared us. And then uh, the story of Krishna is such that he's always growing up. So it's a real life story. So he's always growing up and every time, and he's also moving cities. So then it's in animation is actually a nightmare to have all the kids growing up and then you're moving cities, creating new assets. It's, it's scary actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, our animators made a request. Can we have, have can we do a, create a show that, you know, that we don't keep changing the characters or they don't grow up or, or we don't feel afraid that this is somebody else can come up uh, that's how the idea was uh, idea had come but then the challenge was at that time there was no market in india the only shows that channels were buying were mythological content or historical stories based on historical characters that's the only thing they were buying so it was quite a challenge a the market didn't exit B, there was, uh, uh, there was uh, no money to produce the shows. Uh, so it was, it, we had to f solve all those problems. Mm. So but all that's changed though. India is now one of the, the hottest markets for animation production. Uh, you see a lot of offshoring from other markets to India. You see some amazing stories of creators coming off, of, off our platform too as well with the Choo Choo TVs and USB studios. You guys are doing phenomenal on the platform as well. Uh, what has changed? What, why is suddenly the, the pivot? 
I think, uh, so the, the experience of working with international studios, the experience of uh, uh, working with different TV stations who have done international shows, all this paid off. So Indian animation industry has, is a pretty young industry. So 2000 onwards, the industry actually began. So in 10 years later, everybody is more experienced. Everybody knows exactly. People have stopped jumping studios. So they become more stable. You have developed creatively yourself. And then the best thing is you, you're learning from, from the West, from the East, from everybody. So the learning also pays off. So today they're more experienced. And I think it's just not, it's a matter of time that, you know, with more confidence in Indian studios, I think uh, animation being a universal subject, I think it's just a matter of time. You will see uh, not just from India, from China or a in Asia, mm -hmm. you'll see uh, feature films, uh, worldwide feature films made from this part of the world yeah. being released uh, worldwide. And uh, the reason, all these points add to that and it's just a matter of time we will mm -hmm. see a Marvel or a Disney or a Pixar being born in Asia and it's already I think they're already out there what do you feel about that uh, it would be a dream come true for me <laughs> um, I'm always uh, you know I, I personally am, I'm South Asian so um, I'd love for us to have more of a presence out there I know that there are a lot of people who are Marvel fans um, we've had some uh, interesting uh, ways of getting into uh, South Asia in the past. We did a version of um, Peter Parker, an Indian Peter Parker, named Parminder Padlakar. Uh, I don't think it was that great. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and what we realized is that we don't need to go and, you know, brown up Spider-Man, uh, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, we just need to sort of see what those markets are consuming. They already love our content as it is. Um, but let's try to figure out what that next phase of storytelling is in the region. And um, we have such a vast amount of characters from all different kinds of backgrounds mm -hmm. and experiences. Um, so I think it would be really interesting for us to dig deeper in, you know, the Marvel treasure treasure chest and see what we can find and what we can reimagine um, and bring it out to uh, to that area. We're still trying to establish what that's going to look yeah. like, but I know that there's an interest and a desire, a desire. Do you think there's enough diversity out there in terms of the mindset towards character creation, storytelling? Um, I mean, you've obviously been a pioneer in this space. Yeah, in terms of the creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is. Um, uh, the, the difference is what are the creators that are being, that have spotlights on them who are being elevated and how do we make sure that sort of, you know, the folks up here are the people who are actually creating content, content generators and companies and brands, how are we actually engaging with those creators and bringing them into the fold and celebrating that content? So I think it exists. We just have to find a way to, um, to, to celebrate them and support them. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, you just, you do get better content, you yeah. get better stories. Uh, but, you know, I, I will challenge us to say that we, we have some room to grow. Same question, Olivier. How do you approach diversity in your characters and your content? Um, we, we, uh, I mean, we have on the comedy front and on the preschool front, we are having characters who, you know, who are not white. So yeah. we are, you know, sort of um, trying to, to play our part. You know, in here we're developing a show with uh, Disney Junior right now where the main character is from South Africa. And uh, it's, we're very excited about, about this show. Um, so, you know, we, we, it's, it's a theme that, that re definitely resonates with us. This theme and the theme of empowering uh, girls, that's huge right now for, for us. We, we saw with PJ Masks how, you know, originally the book was three little boys, so we took one character and, you know, sort of turned into a girl, and the, the uh, response from these girls is unbelievable. Absolutely, you know, it was quite emotional seeing how passionate, they are almost more passionate, the girls who are passionate about the show and about Owlette are, you know, it consumes them because they have no other character like that to look up to. So that's why we're developing, so in, in, in PG Mask you have one girl and two boys, so th this show that we're creating with, uh, with uh, d developing is going to be, um, you know, sort of with a, a one girl character, and she's going to be the lead in sort of an, in, in a in a girl power type of a of a role. Yeah. So yeah, we're very excited about that. Now we only have two minutes left. 
And I would actually like, uh, Gemma, if you could actually give us sort of an idea of the, the content behaviors and, and uh, trends happening in Korea too as well when it comes to diversity of characters. What are you looking at? What, what advice would you give anyone out here when they're looking at Korea as a market, target market, Olivier, um, for content? What would you say to them? What, what are some of the things that would work there? So actually in Korea, like, uh, first of all, you it's necessary to co have Korean dubbing, right? Mm. So because we don't speak English native, so, and also like for Korea, like educational content, they keep working well. So we are putting educational themes such as phonics, English learning, and also numbers and the shapes and box animals into our songs because like it works. Because Korean moms are kind of t tiger mom, you know? And also, Korea market is quite diversified, and the IPTV market is really going well. Mm. Though YouTube kids are doing well also, so multiple channel this strategy is necessary for Korea. Yeah. All right. Last question uh, before we do our little fireside chat: the crystal ball question of all, um, the animation studio of the future, or the content over the future. What do you think, Gemma? I really like to stress out that kids' entertainment industry or kids' animation industry also needs the meaningful technological innovations. Mm. So we all need to get close to digital platforms and digital distribution strategy and also the digital transcoding system and web server so that we can just keep, let kids get access to our videos or content easily on demand mm. so that we have to understand the nature of digital platforms and we can, you know, use them widely. Fantastic. Sandra, what do you think? I'm not going to compete with that. That's that tough, eh? <laughs> what Jama said. Can I just ditto that? <laughs> well, we'll have time to talk to my next session. Sophistication, so, technology, sophistication, yeah. Technology, being awesome. <laughs> Future. Sure. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> What's your call? I mean, we, we, di we discussed it on this panel, is making sure that your content is available on every single platform available, including gaming and, you know, sort of embracing, yeah. embracing technology for sure. I think storytelling is definitely the most important and technology. And then we need to give uh, the 360 ex degree experience the kids want. So that would be everything. So I think kids would love to uh, touch and feel the favorite characters, I think. Uh, we need to do that. AR, VR, the future. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, we. I, th I think it will not be time. Uh, I, I mean, it's not too far away that you would see the ep episode in uh, the virtual reality. You, you would probably turn around and see. You can experience it differently. I think this is just uh, maybe a year away. Mm -hmm. So uh, I th we are doing some experiments. So let's see how it goes. Fantastic. Ten seconds. Like yeah, definitely, go. it's it's something very important that we didn't touch on sort of we're surrounded by digital experience, like screen experience, and people, I mean, grown-ups and kids, therefore, are craving real-life experiences mm. nowadays. So experiential, so, you know, costume characters, stage shows, uh, theme parks, et cetera, are absolutely crucial still as relevant. part of your brand rollout strategy. Yeah, still relevant. Excellent. Well, we, time's up. We're getting the, uh, the boot here, but we're going to um, continue with Sana on this and talk a little bit more about technology and the threat of that. Um, <laughs> but thank you again, Rajiv, Olivier, Sana. Thank you, our panelists, for an amazing session. Can I invite um, five guests on stage to uh, take a group photo together? Thank you. Before uh, three panelists sit down.